a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I begin by paying tribute to the Honourable Lady, the Member for Glasgow North West, for her leadership and this campaign, which she is doing such a superb job of, of leading. And, and, and who, whoever the, I can't remember now the name of the gentleman, the, the academic that wrote to her, um, chiding her, reproaching her for the stance she'd taken in relation to this campaign. But I would uh, say, and I think I say it on behalf of all of us, that what she is doing is exactly what an MP should be doing, and shame on anyone who would say otherwise. I specifically compliment her uh, on her presence at the recent Edinburgh event on the hashtag uh, Millions Missing Global Event Day, a uh, day of action, sorry. Um, the purpose of that event was to raise awareness, it was to highlight the need for support for ME sufferers, and it was to call for investment in healthcare and biomedical research. And I think, in a sense, that's an excellent summary to the purpose of this particular debate. Already mentioned was the nature of that event with the, every participant invited to bring a pair of shoes. But what touched me deeply in the publicity for the event was that the symbolism of this, these pairs of shoes was to show the millions of patients who are missing from their lives because of this devastating disease. And the phrase, missing from their lives, deeply touched me. Um, so I rise just for a few moments to highlight the experience of those who are impacted by ME. As my honourable friend said, their evidence is compelling and should be of a primary consideration. It's been upsetting uh, for me to hear how many pe people, including those in the medical profession, are unaware or just lacking in detail of understanding of ME. Um, many uh, persist in believing that this disease is some form of uh, mental illness or a neuro neurological disorder. And indeed, a constituent in Stirling told me as recently as 2011, they were told there is no such thing as ME after they had collapsed at work. And she has since been diagnosed with severe ME. And there are so many distressing stories about the treatment of people who are suffering from ME. Another of my constituents was told repeatedly by different doctors that her ME was a psychological problem and was referred on multiple occasions for psychological assessments. And it took her two and a half years to get a proper ME diagnosis. Thank you for giving me. Does he share my concerns about this um, aspect, the medically unexplained symptoms, which is diverting ME down the psychological path? Yeah, absolutely, I do, I do agree with her uh, in the point that she raises, and thank her for her intervention. Um, I cannot speak too highly of Helen Highland of the ME Association, who is a constituent of mine, who has done so much to raise awareness of the condition across the UK in her role within the ME Association. She's done so much as well to educate me as her Member of Parliament about this disease. Because soon after my election as Member of Parliament for Stirling, Helen reached out to me to inform me about what I could do to help the campaign. And I'm very grateful that my office, myself, have been able to work with her to highlight ME to GPs in Stirling constituency. I'm not terribly sure how they've responded to a letter from their Member of Parliament advising them to be careful of how they diagnose those who have the symptoms of ME, but I'm sure that's a different story. Helen has been involved with the ME Association since her husband took his own life, a year after being diagnosed with ME. The way she told her children of her husband's passing outlines how hard ME is to cope with. She said, and I quote, imagine, our children were very small at the time, imagine a Doctor Who monster getting inside and taking over daddy's head and body. The harder daddy fights, the harder the monster fights back, and the monster always wins. For people with ME and those around them, the diagnosis is crucially important to be told that you have a medically recognised condition is a validation of them. And yet there is so little, still so little known about this illness. There's no easy way of diagnosing it. There's no clear treatment and there's no known cure. And this is what has to change. I will, along with many others, continue to support the ME Association and any campaign which pledges itself to combating ME. 
I'd like to turn now to the first-hand account of a lady called Jules Smith, who wrote to me and asked me to have her voice heard in the debate this afternoon. And I do this because her story, as touching as it is, is not her story alone, but the story of many others. For over 10 years, she, write, she wrote to me, I was a therapist and devoted my life to helping others as best I could. I first became ill about eight years ago, but kept going, putting down the general aches and pains, setting, sorry, but kept going and put it down to general aches and pains. I finally had to give up what I loved doing in November 2016 and had the final diagnosis of severe ME in May 2017. I've been to psychology to be told it's all in my head, pain management to be told to push through the pain, and physiotherapy who told me my muscles were so weak there was nothing they could do. I've been on so many prescribed med medications and vitamins. Last year I was taking in excess of 22 tablets a year, and yet I would still crash. I am 90% house and bed bound, and my GP has exhausted all avenues for me. Therefore, as I was told, quote, you must try and manage your illness as best you can, unquote. I had been told that graded exercise therapy would help me starting off by stretching and then low-impact sports like walking. I'm an ex-runner who was capable of running a 10K every week, so I was familiar with pushing through the pain barrier and grading my exercise, but it has made me more severe. I feel like my life is just wasting away. I get all my prescription medicines on repeat. I get a telephone appointment with my GP every once in a while, and that's it. My husband works long shifts with the Scottish Prison Service, and I'm home alone at least 10 hours a day. Sometimes I have to crawl on my hands and knees to get to the, the bathroom, and I can go days on end without being able to bathe or shower, as I'm just too exhausted to move. I feel like so many others that we are just left to rot, I feel like my mental health is now suffering as I become more and more isolated from society and there's no one to help me and many others like me. I am severely fatigued to the point that I cannot stand upright, otherwise I get so dizzy I'm about to faint. I also have severe laboured breathing and there's nothing recommended but rest and resting doesn't cure ME. I don't wallow in self-pity. I spend what time I can online being an advocate for action for ME and Millions missing Scotland, and whenever I can, I offer support to other members of the social media groups that I am in and share my story and experiences. I have a devoted and caring husband who does everything he physically can to look after me, but it's tough when I'm home alone for so long with no care. I try to do what I can to keep my spirits up, but on days when I crash for no reason and I can't watch TV or read a book, I have, I have to have my curtains drawn and be in a dark room. Sometimes I even need soft silicon earplugs to block out any noise as I get cognitive dysfunction too. This, she wrote to me, this is not living, Stephen. This is just existing. May I thank Jules for allowing me to share her story in this debate. And I am grateful and feel privileged that I was allowed to let her voice heard today in Parliament.